in the end, there's a balance. You know, if you always think you need a computer to close a window, uh, <coughs> you, there's a little reality check that has to come in somewhere. So there's a balance. You have to be able to do the pen and paper approach, but you still need to know how to use these virtual tools to save time and money. So uh, I want to end with uh, some comments on what I did as an engineer. I worked for a few years at a <coughs> space company called MDA Space here on Santa Bellevue. I was a structural engineer there. This was actually the first structure I worked on. That's a feed for an antenna. So it's a very small, uh, small metallic structure, aluminum, titanium, bolts, or steel, uh, and then painted white uh, for thermal reasons. And for the longest time, I never saw it. I was working on a computer model of it. Uh, a lot of nodes connected by elements. I was told it's going to be aluminum, and then you check, and OK, the stress is too big here and here, and thick in parts. Eventually, the iterative process comes around, and you see, wow, I was working on something real. This is just a few kilograms of metal, but it costs uh, about $100,000. Uh, due to a lot of reasons, the precision of machining, but what do you do? Uh, what's a day in the life of an engineer? Well, you work on teams, uh, usually on multiple projects at the same time. There's conceptual design at the beginning, and you have meetings to make sure everyone, every department is happy. And then the detailed design process happens, and here's where the tools really kick in. And once your every every group is happy, when I say every group, I mean design, electronic, thermal, structural. And everyone's satisfied, and it's met the customer demands it would seem, you build it. And then at the same place, you actually test it. So for my side of things, what that meant is, since I'm a structural engineer, I have to make sure it's not going to break. So we take whatever it is we've designed, be it this antenna or another one, and stick it on a shaker. It shakes violently. Actually harder than what it's going to shake when it takes off. And we also put it in the oven. Uh, and we put it in a cooler as well, a very cold refrigerator. The reason is, in space, things go as high as 200 degrees Celsius and as low as minus 150 degrees Celsius, depending if the sun's on it or not. So it has to survive all these tests plus a margin, and then they're satisfied, okay, when we send it up to space, it's not going to work. Because in the end, there are just uh, a few rules when designing uh, most things, but for a satellite in particular, here, here are the rules. It has to work. What that means is it has to take the electrical signal that it puts in and shoot out the electrical signal it's supposed to. So in this order, this is the order of importance. If it doesn't work, there's no point in having it. That being said, just because it looks good on paper, if the parts don't fit together, then again, there's no point. So that's what the design engineers say. They say it has to fit. So if it works and it fits together, everything seems great, but that's when the structural engineer says, OK, it might work and fit, but if it's going to break on takeoff, it's a piece of junk anyway and become space junk. So uh, the structural engineer has to make sure it won't break in the environments that's anticipated, plus a little margin. This is a picture of another uh, mechanical part with motors. Uh, actually, a component of this, which is uh, the initial picture of a full halo. One of these is about this tall and costs about a million dollars. And it weighs about 15 kilograms. Uh, so, this is a reflector system. It's going to send information from Earth back into this horn and down these waveguides. And it's going to be reprocessed and sent back to another place on Earth. That's what satellites generally do, communication satellites. OK, so this is what it looks like on paper before anything's done. And it's given to the structural guy to uh, tear it up into a million pieces. So this is the FDM model for that satellite. It kind of looks the same. You can compare it here to here. And uh, all these bright colors you see here with numbers are the number of the node, those little green intersection points between all the elements. And when we shake it in different environments, we want to know how much that point is accelerating based on the stiffness of the structure and all these other details. And if we look at the stresses within the elements and we're satisfied, then we go and build the thing. And then we see the final product. And the nice thing about working, uh, it's not all engineering companies are like this. Some you only do one side of it and maybe you'll never even see the thing. Uh, so one nice thing about MDA is you're involved in the whole process. We saw the original thing, we worked on it, and then when it arrived, we put it on the shaker table and checked it. So you go from uh, the dream, the imagined thing, to the development, and then you see the real thing. And it's, it's really nice. I mean, I, 
I was only there a few years, and I know of 15 <coughs> pieces of hardware that are certainly on the earth right now that I have a hand. Pretty, pretty nice. Pretty nice. So, uh, conclusions. An engineer solves a wide range of problems using a wide range of tools. The majority of today's tools are virtual. The good news with this is you get the result faster and it's more precise. The bad news is there's a risk of error that can actually go up. It's happening faster. The design takes only six months, you only have that much time to catch if you've made errors. And there's a danger. If you only use these new wonderful tools that are bright and flashy and colorful, you forget maybe about the science behind them. And uh, this is uh, this is this would be terrible. So that's why the time you spend in school is not wasted. If you're going into engineering and you think, oh I'm just learning about you know the forces and uh, looking at a block rolling down that incline, how is this useful? Well, in the end, uh, uh, that mass and spring we saw moving back and forth is no different than any structure. It's just that structure is more complex. You can think that there's a lot of little masses and springs interconnected. And rather than spend our entire lives solving how it's going to work precisely, we, allow, we empower a computer to do that for us. Uh, and in the end, of course, common sense is still required. And so that brings us to the last point, which is, of all the tools available to a person, uh, an engineer's brain is their most important uh, Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Stephen? Any engineers, future engineers? Any engineers? Yes? When you're actually doing stress testing and shaking, are, are the gizmos they're accelerometers. Better. So you're actually measuring and you can compare it to your model to validate the model. This is what, before you, you shake it at full level to see, uh, you actually do a, a model comparison based on a low level test, you see how much it accelerates the, those points. You compare it to what you thought was going to happen. And if there's a big difference, before you go to high level, you check if your model's still valid. If it's not, you use the stress as a predictive or invalid either. Yeah, acceleration. Uh, on occasion, the strain gauge, but it's basically accelerometers tell you the story of the structure. Well, I, I said X rays. X rays, no, no. no. And then you know, you said that space can be kind of negative 150 degrees something? Or colder. Yeah. And it's wondering how to do that. Because I was reading on one page that because there's no nothing for the heat to actually conduct into the data, more problems with overheating when you're just floating through space. Both are issues. When you're in direct contact with the sun, the direct uh, view of the sun. Uh,